If you are a woman watching this video, have you ever been alone in the presence of a man, romantic or otherwise? And even though he hadn't done or said anything overtly threatening or wrong, your gut instinct told you that you needed to get out of that situation immediately. In 1997, two years after serving as a consultant to the prosecution in the O.J. Simpson trial, Rockstar security expert Gavin De Becker decided to publish a groundbreaking how-to book on self-defense. De Becker's book lists a number of case studies and provides a content analysis of the story survivors of violent assaults tell, looking for commonalities in the way predators approach their victims. The result would be the New York Times bestseller and Oprah Book Club perennial favorite, The Gift of Fear. Unlike other self-defense experts who focused on the point of attack, De Becker chose to focus on pins, or pre-incident indicators, those behaviors that might constitute red flags on the part of a predator. The book identifies seven major pins, some of which are common sense and some of which are much harder to spot. They include We language and force teaming that psychologically implies that the victim and the perpetrator have some kind of common problem that they need to work together to solve. Okay. Yeah, set it down. That's good. Uh, get in a truck and I want to push it all the way up. Overly polite or nice behavior to disarm the victim. Excessive detail. This tends to be an indicator of someone who is lying. Typecasting, in which a predator delivers a petty insult just so the person will counter and all of a sudden they're involved in a conversation with someone that they would normally ignore. Loan sharking, or doing unsolicited favors for someone seemingly under the auspices of being altruistic, only to spring a cost on them later on to exploit their sense of obligation. Unsolicited promises. These are the kinds of promises that try to make the victim feel safe even though they haven't mentioned any feeling of danger. It's the predatory equivalent of me thinks he doth protest too much. And finally, ignoring the no. This one seems obvious after three generations of no means no, but there are a lot of ways to ignore a no without making it appear like you're disregarding the basic rules of consent. All of these phenomena have something in common, and that's that when they're used by bad actors, they can override a woman's innate sense of danger. Most women get a gut feeling when they're around a guy who has bad intentions. But according to De Becker, they don't obey that gut feeling out of a sense of obligation to the man's insecurity, or because they're afraid that the no or the rejection will be the thing that sets off the violence. The gift of fear wound up in the hands of Zach Kreger, probably best known for his work in the comedy troupe The Whitest Kids You Know. Are you looking up at me, bitch? Plays on stage. I'm not putting on a play up here. I'm trying to be entertained right now. Mr. President, be quiet. John, calm down. Listen to the woman, John. Kreger sought help from fellow comedian turned horror maestro Jordan Peele, and the result is a film that crafts the nonfiction self help philosophies of The Gift of Fear into one of the scariest films of 2022. Barbarian tells the story of three men. One an apparent nice guy who still violates every single one of De Becker's red flags, another a monster so banal he operates in plain sight, and the third so utterly devoid of self-awareness that he doesn't even understand that he's a predator. Spoiler warning, we will be talking about the events of Barbarian, a film that relies on a number of twists to be effective, so now would be a good time to check out if you don't want it spoiled. And while we're at it, what is the most creative book-to-screen horror adaptation? Let me know in the comments. Zack Kreger's Barbarian is structured similarly to Alfred Hitchcock's classic Psycho, in that we shift narrative several times, with more than one point of view character. But while Psycho's shifts feel like a natural element of the story, Barbarians are more abrupt and intentional, with the first act of the film reading like a dramatized version of De Becker's book. Tess, played by Georgina Campbell, is an appropriately cautious young woman who suffers the awkward fate of being double booked at her Detroit Airbnb with Keith, played by Bill Skarsgård. Keith invites her in out of the rain and then proceeds to dash through all of Gavin De Becker's pre-incident indicators, which is what makes the first 25 minutes of the film so tense. Would you mind pulling up your reservation confirmation just so I can see it? In case I'm some kind of weirdo who's broken in here to sleep? The question invites Tess to either confirm that she finds him suspicious, to which he might become more defensive, or deny it and back off. Either way, it's a conversation she doesn't want to have, 
So she just stares at him until he relents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's fine. No. Let me just find my phone. De Becker explains this in The Gift of Fear. A woman is expected, first and foremost, to respond to every communication from a man. And the response is expected to be one of willingness and attentiveness. It sets the tone for an incredibly awkward sequence for the audience, because half the audience have been in Tess's position before, and the other half have seen a horror movie before. We know what wrong moves can lead to. And it doesn't help that Kreger's camera lingers on Skarsgård in the background, making us wonder what is going through his head as he watches her. Convinced that they are legitimately double booked, Tess plans to head back to her vehicle to make some calls and find new lodgings. But Keith tells her she shouldn't because it's a bad neighborhood. Throughout this sequence, Keith continues to violate the second pin, being overly nice and charming. As De Becker notes, niceness is a decision. It's a strategy of social interaction. It is not a character trait. That's a pretty profound revelation for those of us who want to see the innate goodness of people. As Tess starts making calls, Keith offers to make her some tea. I think there's like some tea in the kitchen. Um, want some tea? I'm okay. Okay. Thank you. I'll just make you a cup. Tess is unsuccessful in finding a room, prompting Keith to jump in and tell her that there's a convention in town. So she probably won't be able to find a hotel room. More than one reviewer has noted that this seems to be a note of contrivance on the part of Kreger. <laughs> I think we both instantly were like, she calls a hotel and it's booked, and we're like, bullshit, she's yeah. in Detroit and a hotel is just booked. But for me, the thing that stood out was not that Tess wasn't able to find a room, it's that she only tried one hotel before Keith interrupted and told her that all the hotels were probably booked. It's possible that there were hundreds of hotel rooms available. She just stopped trying. Keith's solution is for Tess to stay with him. Her in the bedroom and him on the couch. And then tomorrow we'll call these idiots, get our money back, free stay for both of us. Tess offers to take the couch, but Keith demands to be chivalrous. He also refuses to let her get her own bags. Kreger gives us an excellent, ominous shot here, as Tess waits for the sheets to dry and Kreger match cuts to the untouched cup of tea that Keith has brewed for Tess over her objections. Everything about this situation, the casting of Bill Skarsgård, the shot selection, and the dialogue tells us that this is a rotten situation, and Tess should probably get out of there as fast as she can. But with each passing exchange, she gets sucked farther and farther in. At this point, Keith's awkward charm really is disarming, because nothing he's done is overtly dangerous, and he seems to be hyper-aware that he's in the presence of a woman who might see him as a threat. So he's self-monitoring all over the place. And it kind of reminds me of another awkward horror character. But I thought, um, well, I'm wide awake, so, so I, um, it's gonna be a bit not. I thought I'm gonna have some of this here yeah. wine. But I, I then would you do me a favor? Would you have dinner with me? I was just about to myself. You know, nothing special, just sandwiches and milk. But I'd like it very much if you'd come up wine. to the house. But I didn't want to open it before um, you got out of the shower because I, I know so you didn't drink your tea, and would. Well, I totally get that, by the way. I mean, you don't know me. I, I don't set a fancy table, but the kitchen's awful homey. But if I open it while you weren't here, that, um, that, um, fuck, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I'm rambling, Jesus. <sighs> Keith's ramble is impressive here, as he accurately describes her situation and her apprehension. But when a guy like this tries to remove all the little red flags that are piling up unsolicited, that, in and of itself, is a massive red flag. This sequence works on both Tess and the audience, precisely because we know we're watching a horror movie. We just don't know what kind yet. The wine drinking actually goes really well, and they talk practical feminism, including how, if the roles were reversed, Tess would never have let him in. He does express some sympathy about the double standards. All of this would be at home in an inoffensive rom-com on the Lifetime Network. And that's part of the sheer unnerving, unbending, unraveling horror of being a woman alone with a strange man. From the outside, there is a point where genuine connection and perilous vulnerability are identical. In many ways, AJ is the opposite of Keith. He's obnoxious, he's self-oblivious, and he refuses to self-monitor his communication. 
In fact, when we first meet him, this ignorance has come back to bite him in the form of a rape allegation from one of his female co-stars. She's claimed that you were sexually aggressive during the filming of the pilot, and she no longer wants to move forward if you're involved. An accusation that genuinely seems to puzzle AJ. Dumped by the producers of his new sitcom, facing the defense of one lawsuit and the filing of another, AJ turns to his wealth management advisor who tells him that he could buy some time by dumping his properties in Detroit, Michigan. Of course, his lawyer tells him leaving the state is a bad look, given that he's under investigation for a felony. But AJ is so ignorant of his situation, his surroundings, and the potential consequences of his actions, he doesn't even consider his lawyer's advice. While in Detroit, AJ catches up with a childhood friend and describes an all too familiar scenario that sounds an awful lot like date rape. She just took some convincing is off. That's okay. it. Okay, but what the fuck does that mean though? Like, I mean, was she like, did she say no? Was I mean, like, no stop? At first. And for a fleeting moment, Kreger and Justin Long seem to portray AJ as getting it as the words come out of his mouth. But of course, he doesn't get it because he only processes his culpability through the lens of personal growth. See, he was a horrible person, but now he's woke and understands the error of his ways. A thing that his victim would understand if she would just answer the phone when he calls late at night. AJ is the model for the average rapist. He's not a monster in the traditional sense, as we'll see later. He's not someone who's gonna jump out of the bushes with a knife or attack someone in a dark alley. He's just going to persist and persist, and persist. I'm a persistent dude, right? I'm like fucking eye of the tiger. Yeah, you know? and, right. And she came around and that's it. The girl said no, then the answer obviously is no. No. But the thing right. is, is she's not gonna say yeah. no. She would never say no because of the implication. The gift of fear delves deep into a case study that is not about sexual assault, but instead about a man pestering another man for a job. The pest, who is named Tommy in the story, refuses to take no for an answer, but what he does is ignore the very explicit no signals in favor of anchoring himself to any daylight that's left to keep his foot lodged in the door. As the Baker states, if you have to tell a guy you don't want to talk to him 10 times, you are talking to him, nine times more than you wanted to. It's this obliviousness and the earnestness of Justin Long that makes AJ a welcome bit of comic relief after the events of the opening act. Whereas Keith made us feel anxious because any threat that he posed was diffuse and abstract, AJ's utter witlessness at least allows us to feel a sense of intellectual superiority. But Craiger's best trick is to give AJ an enlightenment arc near the end of the film, something that the audience would fully expect if this were his film. And then Craiger yanks it away from him, exposing it for the vacant, solipsistic bullshit that it is. Why do you rich fucking white people insist on seeing every socio-political conflict through the myopic lens of your own self-actualization? This isn't about you! Ultimately, there's nothing to be learned here. AJ Gilbride is the type of dude bro whose brain protects itself with a recursive loop of denial and self-victimization. It's a thing that we call self-serving bias, because everything good he does is attributed to who AJ is as a person and everything bad he does was because of the situation. And he would tell you, if you just remove all the bad situations that make him do bad things, you'll see he's a fundamentally good person. And if you try to make him feel consequences for his actions, well then, you're the bad person. That fucking bitch! Frank is the only overt monster of the film. Portrayed by a cold, almost zen-like Richard Brake, Frank is the traditional serial killer next door. Our only exposure to Frank at his peak is a six minute Steadicam flashback sequence shot with a 12 mm lens to separate Frank from his surroundings. Kreger describes the sequence as making Frank look like an alien in his suburban environment. Frank operates with no emotion and probably not even any malice as he sets his victims up. Unlike AJ who victimized at least one woman through his stupidity, Frank is calculated and purposeful. He's almost professional. And as we see in present day Barbary, he knows exactly what kind of person he is. Confined to his filthy subterranean bed with nothing but a television and VHS of his victims to keep him company, Frank's body has begun to resemble his soul, putrid and decrepit. His room is a sickening shrine to his accomplishments, including several tapes, some with women's names on them, some with physical descriptions, 
and one that simply reads, Puker. Exposed for what he is, Frank takes his own life in an act that is simultaneously a relief for the audience and an easy out for Kreger. Frank is such a small character as a percentage of the movie, but he's the catalyst, the original sin of it all. What little Kreger gives us is recognizable enough that we can fill in the blanks. The more frustrating part is how Frank moves and speaks with such a zombie-like banality that no one seems to notice any of the warning signs. Watching Frank navigate the world, I was reminded of Jeffrey Dahmer, who operated in plain sight, right under the noses of police and neighbors. The flashbacks take place in a very different Detroit, one in which Brightmoor was rapidly starting to decline to its present-day condition. It is at least functional in the 80s. There are stores and traffic and people coming and going amidst the creeping white flight, but people also seem to have their own problems, enough so that a monster like Frank was free to predate young women. Obviously, these are three very different types of men, and Kreger and cinematographer Zach Cooperstein do such a good job with the lighting, the color, the shot selection, that we feel exactly how we're supposed to feel about these characters. Kreger himself has said that he didn't have an agenda, outside of making a horror movie, but he does acknowledge that there are gender and racial issues bubbling underneath the surface for anyone who wants to pierce the crust. But the best art works on several levels, and it has to resonate with people even if they don't intellectualize the content. It has to feel true to life. Barbarian, for all its ridiculous premise and gory over-the-top visuals, will resonate with many viewers. In preparing to write this, I asked eight of my female friends and acquaintances the same question I asked at the beginning. And eight out of eight answered, yes. But even more strikingly, seven out of eight added, every woman has. And that's Barbarian. Thank you for hanging in there. Stay warm, stay safe, wash your hands, return your shopping carts, and I'll see you next time.